Hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca Nagel. I'm a journalist and a citizen of Cherokee Nation. And I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I am honored and humbled to host this conversation with writer, historian, and activist Nick Estes. Nick Estes is a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe. His book, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance, is an important contribution to the national dialogue and historical record. The book gives the fight over the Dakota, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline its full context by tracing the centuries-long history of Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota resistance to colonization. Estes also co-edited Standing Rock, Standing with Standing Rock, both voices from the No Dapple movement with Jess Kieran Dillon. In 2014, Nick Estes co-founded the Red Nation, a hub for indigenous activism and resistance. Too often, indigenous voices and issues are left out of social justice movements and progressive policies. Through media and organizing, Red Nation is changing that. Nick co-hosts their podcast, The Red Nation Podcast, and also co-authored their book, From Border Town Violence to Native Liberation, with Melanie K. Yazi, Jennifer Danette Dale, and David Correa. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Intercept, Jacobin, Indian Country Today, High Country News, and many other publications. Until very recently, he was the assistant professor in American Studies Department at the University of New Mexico. And after recently moving to Minneapolis, he will join the faculty of the University of Minnesota Department of American Indian Studies in 2022. But what Nick adds to our national understanding of indigenous history and current politics is much bigger than this list. It is greater than the sum of its parts. Nick is helping create an analysis of both history and a vision of politics that is often missing from our national discourse. What left and progressive politics look like for indigenous nations and citizens. Today, Nick and I are talking about a topic that unfortunately is very timely how generations of Native children have been the tip of the spear in the attack on Indigenous nations and Indigenous rights. For centuries, the U.S. government has taken Native children from Native families in order to take Native land from Native nations. After the discovery of mass graves last summer in Canada at former residential schools, our country is re-examining one chapter of this history, the so-called so boarding school era. And today, at the same time, we're reliving that history because a federal lawsuit is on its way to the U.S. Supreme Court that threatens the legal structure that defends Native rights in this country. And that lawsuit all started when a group of non-Native foster parents wanted to adopt Native children. So to get us started on this conversation, I am so excited and honored to introduce Nick Estes. Uh, um, it's good to be here. I greet every one of you who is listening from home uh, with a good heart and a handshake. Uh, I'm so honored to be joined by the esteemed Cherokee journalist, uh, Rebecca Nagel. Um, as she said in, at the end of her introduction, you know, you should all check out her podcast series, This Land Podcast, especially season two. Uh, this talk that I'm going to be giving tonight really picks up on that and some of the themes and kind of gives some historical texture to the issues that she's, uh, she's addressing in that particular um, series. Uh, and also check out season one as well, especially if you're a, a legal nerd. Um, I also want to just say thank you to Lannon and Haymarket for hosting tonight's talk. Uh, and without further ado, I will just get right into it. Um, if you want to bring up the slide, uh, John. So uh, this picture is a picture um, from the bluff overlooking a town that I was born and raised in called Chamberlain, South Dakota. And I constantly return to this place, uh, not just in my traveling um, and because I'm from there, but in my mind and, and how I think through a lot of the issues that are confronting 
uh, not just indigenous people, but this uh, this country, uh, the United States. Um, it's called the Gateway to the West, uh, and it has played a very prominent role in history. I mean, if you've seen the movie The Revenant with our boy Leonardo DiCaprio, who gets mauled by a bear and crawls his way to an Oscar, um, this is where... This, it's based off of a real historical narrative of Hugh Glass, um, but this is where he ends up at the end of the movie in a place that's called Fort Kiowa, which is actually across the river from here. And Fort, Fort Kiowa is an actually interesting place because it was one of the first forts, uh, fur trade forts that was built in the area. And if you watch the movie, there's a lot of historical fiction in the movie, but there's also, uh, I think, a, a fair degree of accuracy in terms of the kind of violence that was perpetrated by the fur traders. Uh, these were armed men um, in, in many instances. These were the first so-called man camps that arrived in this area and accompanied the extractive industry of the fur trade. And in one of the kind of more gruesome scenes, there's this depiction of a French fur trader um, raping a, a native woman. Right. And this is also important to remember that this is the introduction, along with capitalist uh, penetration into this area. This is also the introduction of the sex trade in, in this uh, this particular region. Um, so one of the things that I always find interesting is there's kind of an aphasia that happens when we see something in front of us, but we can't quite make the connections that this is a real historical place with a, a real historical people uh, and something that's playing out in the present especially. Um, the Lakota and Dakota name for what is now Chamberlain was Makatipi, which actually my uncle jokes uh, means cave dwellers. Um, and it has two kinds of meanings. One is um, comes from the history that uh, Dakota scholar Elizabeth Cook Lynn uh, told me um, is that when the columns of vengeance that were exterminating the survivors of the U.S. Dakota War in 1862, uh, arrived in this area in 1863, looking for the refugees of that war. Um, the survivors hid in the gumbo cliffs and um, could actually see the faces of the cavalry that was that was chasing them. And that's one name, uh, meaning earth dwellers. The other name comes from the settlers themselves who arrived in this area and had no real relationship to the land and didn't know, you know, um, didn't know how to live with the environment itself. And so they essentially created sod houses, um, which are made out of mud and dirt that were soon destroyed by South Dakota weather, uh, Great Plains weather. Um, so it has these these two kind of meanings. Um, but there's also a, a, another darker history uh, for me personally, and something that I never really wanted to write about, to be honest. Um, and that is the history of the St. Joe's uh, boarding school. If you could go to the next slide. Um, and this was a boarding school that actually, the, the site of which um, started off as a federal uh, mandate or federal boarding school called the Chamberlain boarding, Indian Boarding School. It later be, was moved to Rapid City to facilitate uh, you know, the, the introduction of students from the Western, more uh, further West uh, tribes. Um, but nonetheless, it was taken over by the Catholic Church itself um, and became a boarding school that served the surrounding um, nations, such as my own Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, uh, the Crow Creek uh, Sioux Tribe, as well as um, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. And this was actually land that was gifted, gifted, quote unquote, uh, to the Catholic Church itself. And um, it still remains within the kind of federal uh, boundaries of our treaty and reservation territory, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's church land. Um, and, you know, this, the, the, the photo that I have here is actually of the school uh, museum. Um, and when, as Rebecca had pointed out at the beginning of this conversation, when the news came out about the Canadian residential schools and the discovery, I think people knew, I think the relatives knew that these children were gone. Um, but the discovery and the headlines that kind of uh, came out around the mass burials um, and the and the graves that were found, um, this really sent you know shockwaves through not just Indian country, but through both Canada and the United States. Um, and it really sent a message that there's so much mourning that Native people have yet to do 
And the full magnitude of Native suffering has yet to be entirely understood, especially when it comes to the nightmarish leg legacies of American Indian boarding schools. And while commentators frequently describe these schools as projects of civilization, I, I would like to actually think, the, think about them in a, an entirely different way. Um, but boarding schools serve to provide access to Native land by fundamentally attacking Native families and attacking the tribal structure itself. Um, to and holding children hostage so that their nations would eventually see territory. And of course, one of the primary benefactors of the boarding school system was the Catholic Church, um, which today is the world's largest non-governmental landowner with roughly 177 million acres of property throughout the globe. Um, and part of which, you know, the part of the evidence of exactly how the church acquired its wealth in North America is literally being unearthed with the discovery of um, these uh, these graves. Um, but what's different about uh, a school like, you know, um, St. Joseph Indian School is not so much the, the people who didn't leave the school or who had died there, but those who actually survived, uh, many of whom were my family. Uh, and in, in the course of a public records um, search, uh, you can go to the next slide, um, I had uncovered about 23 uh, complaints and testimonies filed by uh, former um, uh, students at the school, uh, specifically relating to the uh, the um, the rape and molestation of them while they were at the school itself. And this this ranged uh, between the years of the 1960s and 1970s going into the 1980s. And in fact, when I published um, sort of the, the findings of this uh, interview that I had done with one of my relatives in The Guardian, um, some of the survivors of the school who attended the school in, in the 90s also relayed um, their own testimony about what they had experienced there as well. Uh, the school itself has done an amazing job of uh, a PR campaign and in, in sort of silencing the uh, voices of these survivors, and not just the school itself, but the um, the Catholic Church that's backing it. And I think fundamentally, you know, it's not just a question of whether or not these stories um, are put in into the public record, um, but it's whether or not they can be put into the public record. Because the state of South Dakota, under a Republican governor, um, passed a law that essentially raised, uh, that created a statute of limitations that disallowed or barred, or effectively barred, um, survivors from the this specific school from bringing a civil suit against uh, the church or the church and the diocese itself. Um, and so this is really is where my kind of uh, entry into this conversation began. And if you want to go to the next uh, slide, um, this slide is a picture of um, some of the items that were recovered. They're called artifacts in, in this exhibit, um, the school museum exhibit. Many of them are religious items. Some of them are actually spiritual items. I, can, um, I can't really disclose which ones are, but looking at this uh, really evoked an image of my mind. Um, I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, and one of the things that always sticks out in my mind is seeing like the piles of clothes, the piles of shoes, the things that they stripped, um, uh, people who were put into concentration camps during Nazi Germany, um, the things that they, they took from them. And if you can go to the next slide, this is an image of the rosaries that have uh, been taken from migrants crossing the border, many of whom are indigenous. Um, so I, th I think of the the sort of evidence that exists, the you know the the profound kind of uh, material impact that that has of just seeing the visuals of these kinds of things, because fundamentally the removal of children from their families and the placing of them into another group is the legal definition under international law of genocide. And that's what we're really talking about here. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is a picture of the school administrators, um, many of whom are, are uh, Catholic priests. Um, one of them isn't. But um, in the course of uh, the kind of back and forth that I had with my editors at The Guardian, one of the, the public relations people, the media people from the school um, themselves actually reached out and challenged the narrative that I had put forward saying that there had never been any kind of uh, documentation or testimony about uh, abuse um, by priests. And actually, I found three of those school administrators were named in the complaints filed by former, uh, you know, uh, the boarding school survivors that attended St. Joe's. Um, and so in some ways, you know, there's this kind of culture of uh, this uh, culture or conspiracy of silence that surrounds uh, 
um, uh, boarding school and the violence, right? And I think, you know, I think of the case of of George Floyd and how George Floyd was murdered here in the city by a police officer. But what if he had not been murdered? You know, would the the amount of violence, being a survivor of police violence as a black man in America, had have the same effect and have the same impact, right? And so I think while and on one hand we can we can measure, you know, Canada is like literally counting. Do you even, you know, ask yourself this question? We saw the headlines this summer, but do you even know what the number is at right now? Right? It's, it's. I think it's around uh, uh, ten thousand uh, children that they found in Canada, and they're likely to find more and more. But I think the other aspect of it that I'm more concerned about is the lasting impact that they have, not just on my own family. I'm one of, you know, um, tens of thousands of Native families across this country who are one generation removed uh, from the boarding school experience. We're not talking about a 19th century um, policy or a 19th century program. We're talking about something that is relevant to the present. And that doesn't even open you know, the question of uh, Indian child removal as a practice um, that continues uh, on through, as you know, Rebecca has documented in her, her, her work, through the foster care system and the adoption system and the attacks on the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was passed in 1978 to reverse uh, the trend of native child removal. And also this summer, we saw the announcement by the first uh, indigenous woman who's uh, the, the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, that her department in response to the, the graves that were being uncovered in, in Canada, um, that her department would lead an investigation into, quote, the loss of human life, life and lasting consequences of federal Indian boarding schools. Um, and it's not quite clear whether or not, you know, the scope of the investigation will include uh, Catholic Church archives, because um, the Catholic Church, through various, you know, reasons, because it's a church run, a, a faith based institution, is not subject to things like the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. They're not subject to certain disclosures publicly. And in fact, many of the priests' uh, files are, are closed until 50 years after their death. Um, and the Catholic Church, you know, ha as what has been revealed by many of these cases, specifically involving non-Indigenous uh, children, is that the Catholic Church keeps meticulous records on the behavior and the confessions of their priests, and some of which came out during the St. Francis investigation, which is on the Rosebud uh, Indians or uh, Indian reservation, where some of these, you know, Catholic priests were actually themselves Johns. They would, they considered themselves Johns. They would um, go around and pray specifically on young Native girls and admitted to these things in confession, right? And so, the the Catholic Church has this kind of weird legal protection, much like attorney-client privilege. Um, where the church doesn't have to disclose these kinds of confessions. So it's a looming question. And I think that's uh, something that we have to address and we have to be honest about when we're confronting the magnitude of this specific issue. And why is it that a theocratic institution holds so much power and sway over how we tell our histories and how we understand what we're going through in the present? Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and before you know, I, I go further, I just want to um, highlight that many of the things that I'm talking about have been talked about um, by people who are better uh, better serving to this issue. And I just want to name them. One is Sandy Whitehawk, uh, who actually lives here in Minnesota. She herself was adopted out um, to a white family when she was a very young person, um, actually 35 years after the Carlisle Indian School closed down. Denise uh, Lajimadir and her book, uh, Stringing Rosaries, um, she's she's one that really opened the door for me. She's documented um, at least three testimonies from survivors of the St. Joe's Indian School, as well as um, a, about a dozen or so uh, survivors from various Catholic-run uh, boarding schools. Amy Lone Tree, whose work looks specifically at uh, Indian child removal in the present and looking at the formation of the Red Power Movement as a response to um, uh, the relocation programs that put Native children in public schools. And as the boarding schools, uh, off-reservation boarding school system began to wane uh, in support and policy, um, this the states began to be the arbiters of Native child removal and through the foster care system and the adoption programs, as well as Marionette Pember, uh, Christine um, 
McCleave, who's the, the director of the Native American Healing, uh, Native American Boarding School Healing Project, and as well as um, tribal historic preservation officers such as Ben Rod. Um, so uh, this picture that we see in front of us is actually um, a, a picture of the Carlisle uh, Indian Cemetery. Um, and in fact, this is actually the back of uh, the military base because where the Carlisle uh, Boarding School um, exists today, the remnants of it are on an active military base. And in fact, the Carlisle Barracks is one of the uh, oldest military installations uh, in the United States and had existed prior to the Revolutionary War. And in fact, it was where um, George Washington led campaigns of punishment against the Iroquois Confederacy and thus earning the name Town Destroyer because he destroyed, he, he waged total warfare campaigns and every sitting president since then, the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee Confederacy called Town Destroyer. So it has this really kind of deep uh, history. And it's also important to point out that, you know, as Biden has recently said in withdrawing troops from Afghanistan, that the United States has ended America's so-called longest war, that if you just look at the battle streamers on the, the U.S. Uh, Army flag, there are 14 battle streamers um, that commemorate uh, the Indian Wars, 14 different campaigns beginning in 1790 and ending in 1891 with the so-called Pine Ridge campaign, which you know we all know ended in the, at the massacre of Wounded Knee. So in many ways, the, the history of the off-reservation boarding school in its heyday um, really began as a military project. And I think it's important to recognize it as such. Um, I think it, it does a disservice to take the policymakers on their word when they say things like this is a civilization project or even assimilation project, because assimilation itself fundamentally as it was practiced against not just indigenous people, but other people such as Af people uh, who were taken from Africa and elsewhere is one of genocide. Um, so uh, if you can go to the next slide, um, I, you know, I, I always like, um, I don't know, some of this stuff is really difficult to deal with and I, I don't really try to go into the stories of the children themselves because I feel like sometimes there's this tendency to focus only on the trauma itself and not really understand the structures that continue to live on. Because as you know, U.S. historians were taught to periodize history. We're taught to say that there was the boarding school era and now we're in a different era. Right. But if it's like walking into the middle of a movie, you know, and only watching a part of it and saying like you can, you know, and then saying what the rest of the movie is about. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's absurd. And so as a historian and thinking about these issues, I look at it in a longer kind of context and thinking about Indian child removal, but also U.S. imperialism, because fundamentally uh, the boarding school project was at a time when the United States had shifted as, you know, uh, Colonel uh, as Pratt, Richard Pratt, the main architect of the off reservation boarding school uh, and founder of Carlo, uh, you know, embodied in his are epitomized in the title of his memoir from battle school or from battlefield to, to a classroom. Um, this was a project about land theft and it was a project about subduing indigenous nations who are seen as always in the way of westward expansion. And so weakened by the civil war, the United States, you know, capitulated uh, to my nation, the Lakotas, in the aftermath of Red Cloud's war in 1868, or 1866 to 68, um, which had expelled white settlers and military forts from uh, our territory. And, you know, in the, the Powder River uh, base, or Powder River country in present day Montana and Wyoming. And this, of course, resulted in the signing of the Fort Laramie Treaty, setting, setting aside a permanent home of about 35 million acres uh, for the Lakotas. Um, and effectively, just three years after the signing of this historic treaty in 1871, Congress abolished treaty making with uh, Native nations altogether. And so the opening of, of the Carlisle Indian School marked a radical change, uh, not just uh, for um, Lakota people, but also to Indian policy and the aims of U.S. imperialism. And during the, the late 19th century, Plains Indian Wars um, uh, the boarding, the Indian boarding school found a primary purchase. 
the bloody, bloody cons, excuse me, the bloody consequences of two bedrock U.S. institutions, African slavery and Indian killing, inspired uh, Carlisle's founder, Richard Pratt, a military man, to embark on a bold experiment to solve the so-called Indian question of the West um, once outright extermination was no longer palatable. And like many of his peers, Pratt was a Civil War veteran turned Indian fighter, fighter and he, became, he came to regard Indian killing as he had the institution of chattel slavery as unsustainable. A radical solution was needed. And in his autobiography, as I pointed out earlier, um, Pratt transposed the Indian Wars from the frontier of the West to the boarding school in the East. And by removing uh, hundreds of native children and then, uh, and then thousands of the, uh, uh, from their families, he thought he could break the resistance of intransigent native nations, such as my nation, the Lakota nation, which became the first class of Carlisle. So between 1879 and 1900, the Bureau of Indian Affairs opened 24 off-reservation boarding schools, and by 1900, three quarters of all Native children had been enrolled in boarding schools, with a third of this number in off-reservation schools like Carlisle. And Pratt had turned General Philip Sheridan's murderous expression, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, into a new motto, kill the Indian, save the man. Only the military, and according to his thinking, could achieve that kind of goal. And Pratt first came to the idea of the boarding school while co commanding mixed units of freed African-American and Indian scouts in, in the punitive campaigns against Kiowas and Comanches in the southern plains of what is today Texas. He believed the U.S. military as a civilizing influence and could, could do uh, what past policies couldn't do um, because it had forged in his thinking and his observations a sense of duty and loyalty in conquered peoples. And Pratt observed how the Army of the West had successfully brought together poor whites, blacks, and Indians by turning them into Indian fighters and Indian killers. So under white leadership, of course, the military had the greatest civilizing influence on the frontier. And although he, he was a progressive of his era, rejecting biological notions of right, white racial superiority, he subscribed to a social evolutionary theory which regarded white Europeans as the most civilized, at the apotheosis of human society. And he placed black people above native people in terms of social development and readiness for American citizenship. He believed slavery was, quote, a more humane and real civilizer than the reservation system. Slavery, he thought, was the ultimate, quote unquote, Americanizer, quote, forcing Negroes to live among us and becoming producers as opposed to the Indian system that through its policy of tribally segregating Indians on reservation. In other words, forced alienation starting at birth, the ripping of an entire group of people from their homeland, language, family, and culture, uh, and enslavement with intimate oversight by white overlords had prepared black people for assimilation according to his view. So this is kind of a, you know, something that I don't see a lot in the boarding school literature is looking at how Pratt himself was trying to enable or reenact what, um, uh, you know, black studies scholars call natal alienation, you know, which itself is a form of genocide. We can't talk about African slavery without that term genocide because that's fundamentally what it is. And we should shift our thinking away from this idea that genocide is this war of attrition that fundamentally means the wiping out of an entire you know, group of people. But it's about destroying in whole or in part, as the, as the genocide convention reads, uh, a group of people. It's the intent behind it, right? And I think that's what's important here. On one hand, to enslave, to enforce a, la a labor regime, and on the other, to take land. Uh, it's also important to point out that the first off reservation or the first experiment for the boarding school uh, happened in, in 1874 when um, uh, Pratt kind of commandeered a military tribunal that had convicted uh, leaders of, of Plains tribes um, and had essentially, uh, con you know, sentenced them to prison. Um, and in, in, seven, in 1975, or excuse me, in 1875, Pratt became the jailer of 72 uh, indigenous leaders at Fort Marion, Florida, Florida, 
And he said, quote, a few good, a few of the good of the chiefs were sent as hostages for the good behavior of their people. Um, and so this is important to remember that this is his thinking, you know, early on, like that the architect of the off reservation boarding school was saying that we could take hostage leadership um, to force their people to es essentially acquiesce to whatever the United States government um, and, you know, land hungry <laughs> corporations or whatever it is um, want to, you know, get out of, of native nations. Um, and he, he also observed that they learned these prisoners learned by heart life's first lesson, which is to obey. So this, this small experiment eventually became the basis for the, the Carlisle Indian school. Um, and so the success of Fort Marion convinced Indian reformers to authorize uh, the Indian Bureau in part in a weird partnership with the U.S. military uh, to, to begin this process of assimilation of taking children and putting them into um, off-reservation boarding schools. And they targeted uh, specifically the Rosebud Agency as well as the Pine Ridge Agency, which were considered two hostile bands of Lakota people, right? You had Sinte Gleshka, Spotted Tail, as well as... Um, Machpia Luta or uh, Red Cloud, essentially uh, unwilling to negotiate any more land sessions to the United States because of what had happened with the, the abolition of treaty making, as well as the theft of the Black Hills. Um, and so it was also a way to essentially attract these this leadership um, to Washington, D.C., to force them into any kind of negotiation with with the Congress um, to essentially adopt things um, later, you know, the 1889 um, Sioux Agreement, which broke us up into the the nine modern day or the, the, the reservations that we have today, because on the way to Washington, D.C. by rail, one would go through Carlisle. Right. And so it was an incentive to many of these leadership to see their children. Right, who they didn't hear from, who they didn't know um, what was going on, but I think it's also important to point out that the that this was not a this was not an educational institution. Many of these uh, boarding schools were not educational institutions, and you know, available data suggests that most uh, many of the students succumb to illnesses, um, and some and those who were fortunate to be sent home if they got sick often died in transit or. Uh, died shortly uh, thereupon returning. Um, and the unsanitary conditions in this in these in Carlisle specifically um, essentially became a uh, the reason why many of the you know uh, contagious diseases were spread, but also the reason why many people, um, many children died there. If you could go to the the next slide. Um, this slide is actually taken, or this picture is actually taken from um, inside of the the brig or the the military prison or the military jail that was also used um, to house intransigent uh, native children. Um, so you had the transference of, you know, the, the last people, the last people to be held in the jail um, were essentially the the British uh, soldiers that were captured during the Revolutionary War and placed into that jail. And then, you know, Pratt and his crew essentially repurposed it as a child jail. Right. And so these were essentially carceral institutions. I don't think um, we can really talk about them in any other any other way. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, um, this is a, a picture. There was a lot of uh, not just at Carlisle, but many of these boarding school institutions. There was a lot of kind of before and after um, photos that were taken to show the uh, native children in their savage state and then in their civilized state. Uh, but I, what I think is most revealing and important about this particular picture is the military uniforms that were essentially hand-me-downs or leftover surplus army uniforms from the Civil War itself. And that these children were inculcated not only with uh, American patriotism, um, but also uh, with military discipline. And as such, as the children themselves, uh, or as uh, the Carla Indian School uh, began to close its doors, um, those children had essentially received uh, basic training to enter the armed services. And so as the United States closed the off-reservation or Carlisle Indian School, it was beginning to enter the war in Europe. And so many of these children joined the army, not as citizens, not as, um, you know, not as, uh, uh, as children, not even, you know, they weren't even citizens. And so, but they had that training, they had that military discipline. And so I also think it, the Carlisle Indian School and the off-reservation boarding school points to, uh, helps us locate where, the United States Army specifically has exploited um, what they call a warrior tradition in indigenous communities and why we see a lot of 
uh, military service uh, in indigenous communities. It actually stems from the boarding school system. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, I'm going to transition into a, a different part, a different period, but I, I want to just uh, highlight the work that the the Native American National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition has done. Um, they're one of the the you know the I when I spoke with um, Denise uh, Lajimadir, she told me that they started off with a budget of five thousand um, dollars, and have you know through blood, sweat, and tears been tracking and counting the number of boarding schools. Um, uh, in the United States, because simply the government has refused to do so, um, or hasn't kept the records, right? And I think this is a, a larger problem in in how we understand American history, uh, and it's not to reduce the experience of Indigenous people to numbers and quantification. But one thing I always ask my students when I teach them is like, how many Indian massacres, you know, were there in the United States? Can you name them? How many can you count off, you know, off the top of your head? If you, you know, and you ask anyone, and you know, even experts, historians, they can't answer that question. And if you ask how many boarding schools, how many Native children went through those boarding schools, how many died there, the government and the, the institutions that were meant to take care of these children can't actually tell you. Um, and this is something that, you know, we kind of see in, in the archival record. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, in two studies from 1969, uh, to 1974, the Association on American Indian Affairs found that 25 to 35 percent of all Native children had been uh, separated from families and placed into foster homes or adopted homes or institutions. 90 percent, 90 percent were placed in non-Indian homes. And so if we think about this in terms of, um, you know, uh, the the effect that it had on this generation, this is considered, you know, the end of the off-reservation boarding school system, um, and but nonetheless, child removal kind of continues almost unabated uh, within this era. And this era in between 1969 and 1973 is also known as you know the height of the Red Power movement, when uh, you know you had mass relocation programs, uh, the the matriculation of Native people from reservation um, locations to urban locations. You also had the the founding of you know what we now know as the red power movement which began at a place called alcatraz um and alcatraz is, is uh interesting uh, for a variety of reasons um you know um because the prison island was also the site where four modoc people were hanged in resistance uh you know during the the california indian genocide and where paiute and apache prisoners of war and other western nations were imprisoned in the late 19th century for resisting the invasion invasion by the united states and in 1894 uh the military imprisoned 19 hopi men at alcatraz as punishment for refusing to send their children to government and church-run boarding schools the indigenous prisoners of Alcatraz had faced similar conditions that red power activists had faced. A harsh landscape purposely isolated from the rest of the world, quote unquote, uninhabitable, abandoned and in disrepair, much like Indian reservations from which they had come. And so this became a kind of a symbolic, uh, more than a symbolic kind of location because the activists, you know, Indians of all tribes had actually proposed building an all Indian university where language, where culture would be taught once again. If you can go to the next slide, uh, you know, Alcatraz catalyzed an indigenous movement that kicked off occupations of federal lands and buildings across the continent, the height of which occurred during the 71 day siege at Wounded Knee in 1973 where indigenous uh, activists of the American Indian movement took over the small town in Pine Ridge Indian Reservation uh, and demanded the ouster of a, a corrupt tribal government and declared independence from the United States. So um, this picture is a picture of Madonna Thunderhawk who has been an interlocutor of mine for quite some time. Um, and she helped, you know, she was at the Wounded Knee occupation. I've done uh, several um, oral histories with her about that experience. Uh, but one thing I think often gets overshadowed in this, you know, era of braids and shades is not only the role of women, but also the alternatives that the American Indian movement and the Red Power movement were actually putting forward. And in in 19 or after the flood of 1972 in Rapid City, um, you know, uh, Madonna Thunderhawk, as well as a group of children, um, kind of took over this house that was abandoned uh, in in Rapid City, South Dakota. And she says there was nothing wrong with it, so they let us use it. <laughs> 
And so we had, that's where we had our first school, she told me. And we didn't call it a school. The, the kids eventually named it, she says. We will remember survival school. Because they said, we'll remember everything that happened. Wounded Knee, 1890. Wounded Knee, 73. You know, all the other things. We'll remember the different things that happened, how they put everybody in boarding schools, how they stole the land, all that kind of stuff. So they said, we will remember. And so the formation of the Red Power Movement, the founding of the, the American Indian Movement in the city that I'm currently located in, in Minneapolis, was fundamentally founded, yes, as a community patrol, but also as you know, Clyde Belcourt, one of the founders, uh, told Amy Lone Tree in an interview, it was founded to end Indian child removal. That was one of the primary planks because, because of relocation, native children were put into public schools and thus became under the surveillance of teachers and social workers, right? And this is where you begin to see the, the removal of children from families for things such as quote unquote neglect, right? And so this was, this was a kind of a profound insight because oftentimes we look at this era for its militancy, but we don't look at this era for the alternative that it was actually proposing and why, you know, the American Indian movement was founded in an urban center and why it had such resonance, not just in urban locations, but in reservation locations as, you know, the We Will Remember Survival School moved to Pine Ridge Agency and stayed there uh, for at least um, six or seven more years after its founding. So um, can you go to the next slide? And then this is just a pamphlet from the We Will Remember Survival School. And then the next slide after that. Um, so the 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 camp uh, that the the camps that were founded at Standing Rock really carried this tradition uh, carried on this tradition of radical land-based education in response to child removal you know uh, Madonna Thunderhawk works for Lakota People Law Project they've brought multiple lawsuits against the state of South Dakota for you know the the removal of native children uh, from their families so when we say like oh the heyday of the red power movement was only between 1969 and 1974 we often forget the quiet work that continues on that many of these um, that many of these uh, activists especially the women continued doing the work against indian child removal well into you know the present day right and so the camps at standing rock you know um were us were an unprecedented concentration of indigenous knowledge keepers Standing Rock Lakota language specialist Elena Eagleshield saw this. She went to every camp asking if they could share their knowledge with the children and families brought with them. From there, Eagleshield recalled, I was told um, that we need a school and a place for children to be. So she founded the Mini Wichoni Nakiji Owa Yawa. <laughs> I don't know if I said that my Lakota is really bad. I apologize. Um, but that translates to the Defenders of the Water School, a name chosen by the students themselves, much like the We Will Remember School. Education Center Treaties, Language, Culture, and Land, uh, and, land and Water Defense. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, I just want to kind of conclude uh, this, this talk by thinking about um, not just the long history of Indian child removal, um, but also how it had spawned and fomented resistance and alternatives because it's not that native people themselves are against education, right? It's how that education is uh, thrust upon us and the reasons for it, right? Um, America often is reduced to two things, winners and losers, we're told. And by that standards, Indian, Indians are the constant losers of history. And for, for that matter, so too is anyone who doesn't immediately buy into what America is selling. The narrative we're sold is that indigenous resistance is a string of failures. In 2016, water protectors, quote unquote, lost at Standing Rock because the Dakota Access Pipeline was built. Later, the Wet'suwet'en lost because the Unistoten camp had been raided by police uh, and the land occupied by coastal gas link pipeline workers. And more, you know, and after that, the Kai lost at Mauna Kea because mainstream media was obsessed with the science versus culture debate, not indigenous land rights. And the Kanaka Maoli relinquished, uh, needed to relinquish, according to this view, superstition and accept progress as inevitable by having a $3.4 billion telescope built next to their 20 to next to two, 22 other telescopes on a sacred mountain. And more recently, we're told that the water protectors at Line 3 lost 
um, because the Enbridge Corporation finished the project with much help, not only from uh, Obama and Trump, but much help from the, uh, the Biden administration as well. Um, and so while indigenous peoples are, are told to quit living in the past, settlers are urged to make America great again under Trump, or more recently under Bi Biden, America is back by invoking the country's mythic halcyon days. That's the story America likes to tell itself, the story of winning the future of this land by winning its past. But the truth is quite opposite. America fears the past. Reduced to its basic components, the history of colonization boils down to three things, God, gold, and glory. Natives had all the gold or land, settlers brought God. Now natives have God and the Bible and the settlers have all the gold and the wealth, the story goes. But glory is the most precarious elements of this formula. Is there honor in invasion, slavery, genocide, and theft? The answer to that question changes throughout time, but we don't have to journey too far into history to, the res to see that the response by indigenous standards is clearly no. If anything, paradoxically, glory belongs to history's losers. And so while a captivated public only saw the spectacle of militancy during the Red Power Movement, James Baldwin, who we all may know, saw something else. What Americans mean by history is something they can forget, he said, reflecting on this period of indigenous uprisings. They don't know they have to pay for their history because the Indians have paid for it every inch and every hour. That's why they were at Wounded Knee and that's why they took Alcatraz, he said. Perhaps because they have paid such a heavy price for this history, Natives have a capacious, notion, capacious notions of freedom and belonging. At Alcatraz and Standing Rock, at Line 3, indigenous peoples turned to those seen as different and made them into familiars, into allies. They made relations. This is quite diff This is a, the quiet strength, the victory of indigenous movements over time, the power of love and humanity that doesn't make headlines. It's what made, motivated the ghost dancers of Bigfoot's band who were gunned down at Wounded Knee in 1890, the water protectors at Standing Rock in 2016 and Line 3 this summer. And I just want to end with this quote by Dakota anthropologist Ella Deloria, who recorded the following description of the ghost dance from the viewpoint of an unnamed Lakota man who participated in the dance at, at the Pine Ridge Agency as a young runaway from the boarding school or as a young run, runaway from boarding school. He says, the rumor got about, the dead are to return, the buffalo are to return, the Dakota people will get their own way of life back, the white people will soon go away, and that will mean happier times for us once more. That part about the dead returning was what appealed to me. Waking up to absorb, or waking up to the drab and wretched present after such a glowing vision of the ghost dance, it was little wonder that they walked as if their poor hearts would break into two with disillusionment, but at least they had seen. They, prefer, they preferred that to the rest, or they preferred that to rest or food or sleep. And I suppose the authorities did think they were crazy, but they weren't. They were only terribly unhappy. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that talk, Nick. That was so um, that was so powerful. Um, what I wanted to do is build on some of the history that Nick shared about the systemic removal of Native children and bring us up to the present day, um, because unfortunately, it hasn't stopped. So um, today, Native children are still removed, um, now it's by child welfare systems, at alarming rates uh, from their families. And so just a few statistics, um, you know, in the state of Minnesota, um, you know, where Nick was talking about how, um, you know, AIM really started with the um, with wanting to prevent child removal in Minneapolis, um, in the state of Minnesota, one in three Native children will enter foster care before they turn 18. Um, and one in 10 Native babies will actually be removed from their families before their first birthday. Um, nationally, the rate for white babies is one in 100. Um, in Hennepin County, which is the county um, where Minneapolis is, 
um, Native children are um, 34 times more likely to be removed from their families than white children. And some folks might think, you know, and we, you hear different versions of this is like, oh, well, there are just more problems in Native families, you know, and things like that. Um, but when you look at actual the data on the reasons for removal, um, white children are actually more likely um, to be removed for allegations of um, physical or sexual abuse. And Native children are more likely to be removed for the much more nebulous um, category of um, neglect. Um, and poverty um, oftentimes um, is what constitutes neglect. You know, I was talking to um, a parent advocate at a really amazing organization in Minneapolis, the Equal Law Center, and she was talking about how some of the homeless families that she's working with, so families who are homeless, um, were actually dealing with, um, uh, they were being, their children were being taken for educational neglect because their children weren't being taken to school. But the, it was at a time, when, you know, the basic need of the family was housing. Um, and so, you know, a couple of these cases where Native children were removed from their families and placed with non-Native foster um, parents have become these high profile ICWA cases where, you know, the legacy of the Indian Child Welfare Act is under attack. And um, Nick, what I wanted to ask you about is, you know, how these cases are talked about in the media, which is that the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was created to keep Native children with Native families, is sort of is framed as ripping Native children away from white homes. And that's the tragedy. You know, that's that's the wrong Whereas the trauma of the separation that's happening with these Native families is rarely recognized. And I was wondering if you could put that into context for us. How does this rhetoric of what's, you know, best for Native children parallel the rhetoric of the boarding school era and the Indian Adoption Project? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And of course, I couldn't <laughs> be as comprehensive as I, I would like. And, I, you know, first of all, I, I've learned a lot from your work, Rebecca, on, on this particular issue, because when you talk to those families, when you're interviewing those families, it's it's quite clear. It's like they're, you know, that often goes unrecognized within the record itself, of like what it means to actually tear these, these families apart. And one thing that I always, I, I, I can't imagine, and I've tried to imagine this, but imagine being taken from your home and then, you know, you have this experience, you have this memory of your family and then returning to that family and not being able to communicate with your mother and not being able to literally speak the same language, right? Not even being able to describe to them the traumas that you may have endured while be, being taken from your, you know, your home and put into uh, a reservation boarding school, or imagine, in so, it was as was the case in many instances, that your family thought this was best for you. You know, um, I think the 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 call that goes out by, or the the counter argument that uh, St. Joe's often puts out um, as a Catholic-run boarding school is that these families looked to us, right, to um, educate their children. We were providing a necessary service, and you have to ask yourself, what was like, why would you know, what circumstances existed so that Native families, Native parents were like, I need to actually give up my child. I can't feed them. I can't house them. I can't close, clothe them. And But then why is it that the Catholic Church, you know, steps in to kind of fill those needs? And then, in, and in, you know, what happens in that situation and what happens, you know, in the situation, like even from where I'm from, the people who are carrying out, who work for the school, often position themselves as as victims, you know, of, of being like this angry native man is, you know, he's coming after us or whatever, and he's not recognizing the good that happened at these schools. And it's like, yeah, like children didn't stop being human when they went to these schools. Like, why is that a profound thing to point out? Like, of course they laughed. Of course they cried. Of course they had normal human reactions. Like, why do we have to prove that native children are human in, in environments that, you know, may not you know, maybe violent or maybe, you know, not in their best interest, right? I'm sure that Native children adopted out to non-Native families love their those parents and those adopted parents. But that's not the question that I'm asking. I don't, I mean, it, it's important. I care about it. But at the same time, it's the reason why this school exists, the reason why 
child removal policies exist is is much more of an interesting question to me to understand than whether or not white 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 parents can love a native child you know that's a moot point of course you know like we're human beings we're not you know removed from humanity where that's that's the case but i think the more important question is you as you point out in in your podcast and that always really concerns me is the question of the indian child welfare act and i see this tendency not happening just in the legal realm but i also see it happening in the academy where native and tribal identity get reduced to race mm-hmm. because it, it, it that was the point you know that was the point of of these so-called assimilation policies from the get-go was to reduce uh, this to some kind of biological racial difference, right? And of course, we you know we live in this you know there's like the woke, I call it like the woke crowd, but then there's like that woke crowd exists on on the right too, where it's like well if race is a social construct, then why are we you know why are we having race based legislation like the Indian Child Welfare Act? Like we're just we're just doing you know we're doing a, a civil service to you all. We're giving you civil rights like because you're being held back by this Indian system. That was the same argument to put native children on uh, in boarding schools. That was the same argument for termination. Um, and it, it's fundamentally you know, paternalistic on one hand, but it also completely erases the question of membership, of citizenship, and the fact that oftentimes, I mean, you know, tribal citizenship and enrollment is a whole nother question, but it reduces our belonging to a tribe to racial, like biology, right? And so by the mere fact of, you know, imposing what they see as a colorblind policy, they're actually reinforcing a a biological essentialism, you know? And so that's kind of, I mean, I would like to hear your thoughts on this because- Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, and to give people a little bit more background, the case case that's heading to the Supreme Court right now is Brackeen v. Holland. And it's arguing basically on two grounds that this law, the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, is unconstitutional. So one of the grounds that they're arguing is that it violates states' rights. Um, Basically, it's this anti-commandeering doctrine. But then kind of the biggest thrust of these anti-ICWA cases is that they're using the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, um, which was created at the um, end of the Civil War and when our country was trying to um, create a system of racial equity. But it was almost immediately um, abandoned by the courts. You know, there's actually a, a Civil Rights Act um, from the late 1800s that um, the Supreme Court said violated the 14th Amendment because it recognized differences in race. And so people have really used the 14th Amendment as a weapon to attack, you know, everything from from affirmative action now to ICWA. And what's really unique about them using this area in the, in in the area of federal Indian law is that under the law, tribes and tribal citizens are a political category, not a racial category, right? Mm -hmm. And so just like I'm a citizen of the United States and a resident of Oklahoma, so certain laws apply to me and other ones don't, um, because I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation, certain laws apply to me. And it's like any other kind of nation or political status. And that's actually how ICWA works. It actually only applies to children who are either enrolled in a tribe or eligible for enrollment. Um, And so I think what's scary, you know, for me as somebody who's, you know, interested in tribal sovereignty and indigenous rights and why I think everyone should be paying attention to this case is that what is scary is that if ICWA is based on race, well, then what about the hospital where I get my health care? Like, how can that hospital treat tribal citizens but refuse services to other people? What about our land and treaty rights? What other, quote, like, racial group has a land base or a court system or a police force or a tribal government, you know, and all of your its own school system, right? And so um, I think that that's what the fear is with this attack on ICWA is that it's kind of like the first thread on a sweater and that if people pull it, then the rest of um, the sweater um, falls apart, basically. Yeah, and I think just to kind of pick up on that thread, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, you you know, you've been an uh, outspoken critic of like somebody like, you know, Elizabeth Warren, who claims to be, you know, cl- or claimed to be Cherokee. And I think 
there's this tendency to reduce native identity to a category of race or DNA without understanding what you're exactly what you're talking about. And to kind of put that into context, you know, like if we just talk about adoption, right? The majority of like international adoptees come from or to the United States come from China, Russia, Guatemala, South Korea, and Ethiopia. And all of these countries have increased restrictions on foreign adoption laws, mm -hmm. you know, and it's been in decline, you know, and, and so ICWA really does is like, it's actually responding to, you know, like what many of these sovereign nations, you know, whether we agree with them politically or not, are impl implementing to prevent the taking of their children and, you know, and putting, you know, adopting them out. So what ICWA is really empowering tribes to do is that same scenario. We're just protecting our citizens. You know, it's a political, it's a, it's a political and legal issue for us. It's not about race. You know, we have the right and the sovereignty to decide who belongs to our tribe. And, you know, fundamentally, I, I think there's just a moral argument here too, that you've, you've pointed out in the podcast where it's just like, we, you know, why do we, why do we need a law in, in 1978, um, to legalize our religion, right? <laughs> why do we need a law, uh, in 1978 again, to uh, you know, legalize the native family and to say that this has you know sanctity and native children, you know, the tribe should should determine you know what happens to it mem its members. Like I don't think that is a radical proposal in many ways. And as you've pointed out, since the passage of ICWA, in some instances, you know, the removal of native children has increased. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think the point you brought up about international adoption really goes to that issue. Because I think one thing we have a difficult time admitting about adoption is that for the most part, it's the transfer of a child from a family with less resources to a family that has more resources. And that was definitely the case within international adoption. And that imbalance in power led to things, you know, as extreme as kidnapping children, you know, and that's why many of those countries, you know, Ethiopia, Guatemala, do not allow American families to adopt their children anymore. And that pressure, what it has created is a situation where there are less adoptable children than people who are looking to adopt. And now folks are actually turning to the foster care system, um, which I think raises a lot of ethical concerns because the a foster care system isn't created to help people find adoptable children. It's created to support children and their families in a moment of crisis. And so, yeah, there's definitely a lot of interlocking issues there. I wanted to talk about a couple bigger picture um, questions around, you know, the politics that you talked about. And, and like I mentioned in the intro, I think a lot of the work that you do is creating a vision for and language for around progressive indigenous led politics. And what I wanted to ask you is kind of twofold, um, which is why do you think that organizations on the left and social justice movements often leave indigenous issues out of their work? And, and what can change or what needs to change so that our issues are included? I think, um, you know, just like, again, to bring it back to this conversation about, you know, boarding schools. I remember um, I had a fellowship at Harvard and uh, I was amongst, you know, the elite of the elite, so to speak. It's like where the ruling class is literally reproduced. And these were historians. Like they were like, you know, history. Um, and they were like, what is, you know, I was, I was talking a little bit and I was like, you know, Harvard was sort of a boarding school. It was founded as a boarding school for native families. It was part of this treaty. And they're like, they're like, what do you mean a boarding school? Like, you mean, because they, in their minds, they were like, yeah, I went to a boarding school. Like, and, and so it was just funny because it like, it goes back to that instance of like, you know, in Chamberlain, South Dakota, okay, you may be able, like, as a, the liberal mind might be able to dismiss like rural kind of backwardsness, which I don't agree with. I don't think these people are backwards. It's just the education that they've received um, that they can be so like ignorant of this kind of genocidal institution that many people are currently employed at that has this legacy, I should say. I don't think it's a genocidal institution today, but it has this leg legacy as one, right? But at Harvard, you know, like, you know, liberal blue, whatever, you know, like that's where Elizabeth Warren worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, like there's there's also that ignorance as well. Like it's not, so it's like 
we it's it's easy to say like oh well this only exists on the right and it's like but at the same time it's like well there's no language there's no conceptual basis for average americans in this country to even begin to grasp this history and so i don't i don't blame the ignorant you know uh i blame the system itself for not allowing us to even have a conversation it's like where do you think all this land come came from you know like you stole laborers you you know you brought like you may have brought the wealth but land didn't just fall from the sky you know <laughs> and so it, it's it's this harder it's this harder question and then you know the, there's also a tendency to promote you know on the right you know we have the kind of great replacement thesis that you know the white uh you know the the so-called white genocide that white genocide is happening and, you know, like, you know, it becomes the fear mongering on the right. But I think there's a tendency on the left to, to also like not allow for like indigenous nationhood, you know, as okay. if there can only be one country and the real nation is the United States because indigenous nations are just ethno states. We, I mean, we, we can laugh about that, but that's, I've heard that from like very, you know, smart people on the left um, without even understanding that like liberal democracy fundamentally is based on individual rights of of people of citizens this was this is the legal basis at which they're attacking tribal sovereignty because they're fundamentally despise and are antagonistic to collective communal rights that we that we have as as indigenous people yeah but it's also to say that that's not the only alternative that's not the only game in town so to speak you know uh, and other nations have experimented with you know plurinationalism to recognize and to integrate many different groups of people versus privileging the the individual citizen as kind of the arbiter of all you know rights and i think you know this is what bind deloria talked about in his peoplehood thesis and and custer died for your sins like in 1969 he was he was you know strongly identifying with black nationalism in kwame ture to say you know this the experience of Indigenous people is similar to African American people and is also similar to what we now know as, you know, Mexican American people, because we became citizens, not as individuals, we became citizens through fiat as groups of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether it was the, you know, the abolition of slavery and the granting of citizenship, whether it was, you know, the, the annexation through imperialist wars of a third of Mexico um, in 1848, or whether it was through the, the so-called Indian citizenship of 1924, we all became citizens of this country as entire groups of people. That's fundamentally different than immigrants who, who came from Europe. They became citizens as individuals. And so there's something to be said about that. And I think if you look at the the movements that are really pushing the agenda, I didn't get, I actually had this in my talk, but I couldn't get to it. But thinking about line three, thinking about the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, what happened in Wet'suwet'en, Unistatin camp, is that indigenous movements are challenging about a quarter of the carbon emissions mm -hmm. from the United States and Canada, according to a, a, a report by the Indigenous Environmental Network. So no wonder they, you know, and this is this is a broad array of tactics that the uh, indigenous movements are are utilizing, whether it's through the courts, whether it's through Congress, whether it's through direct action, you know, uh, all the it's a it's an array of tactics that they've that they're challenging a quarter of carbon emissions. And yet what can what movement in the United States beyond that can we say has had that kind of impact challenging the fossil fuel industry? So it's no wonder they want to use a backdoor like the Indian Child uh, Welfare Act, whether you're the Cato Institute, the, Gold, the, the Goldwater Institute or whatever, um, to attack tribal sovereignty because there are, there are vested interests here. You know, this is like, yeah. these are powerful people. Yeah, and it, it, still, it still comes down to resource extraction, you know, from the gold rush to now. Um, that actually leads into, almost perfectly into another question I wanted to ask you, um, which is about, you know, COP26. This week, world leaders are finishing climate talks and negotiations in Glasgow, and their indig indigenous leaders from the U.S. and the globe are pushing for climate solutions that include um, indigenous people. And as a member of Red Nation, you've advocated for that with the Red New Deal. And what I wanted to ask you um, 
is how is the sovereignty of indigenous nations tied to the health and future of our planet? Can, can we solve the climate crisis without putting indigenous sovereignty first? <laughs> Since you asked a yes or no question, I'll just say no. <laughs> no, I'm just um, no, I mean it's it's a really great question, but it's also I, I just want to like take a step back too because we actually have to see, you know, oftentimes it's like to understand what indigenous sovereignty is. It, it's not just a buzzword, you know. I think when we talk about you know Biden's you know green jobs proposal or whatever it is. Um, we have to remember that indigenous caretakers and land defenders are doing green jobs, right? Um, that like here in, in Minnesota, you know, had the, the pleasure and opportunity of talking to many Anishinaabe relatives about the importance of monomen and it's, you know, wild rice and its centrality, not just to this kind of esoteric cultural knowledge or, or whatever, um, that I think often, you know, when you start talking about indigenous spirituality, like flute music plays in people's ears and you hear like a drum beat. But what I was told, you know, we went to a rice bed that was, you know, at a, it was a historic drought here in the, in the state. And we went to this rice bed and, you know, the woman we were with, she was like, yeah, we, you know, normally we haul out like maybe 80 pounds a day of wild rice. And she's like, this is all we got. And it was like less than a half a cup. And she's like, this isn't just like, you know, devastating on the sense of like, you know, me growing up and having this relationship with this land, she's like, this directly impacts, you know, our, our jobs because people have seasonal income, you know, that depends on, on ricing, right. And the tribe itself, you know, has made, has turned a profit on this. This is like their economy to protect these rice beds. Right. And if we talk about how, you know, just in the short time span of the United States uh, in its existence of less than, you know, 250 years, it has played an outsized role in not only carbon emissions, but environmental degradation, right? And it's not to glorify indigenous, you know, ways of uh, being that were prior to, you know, capitalism and colonialism, but it's also to recognize that not all societies tend towards destroying their own planet or their own you know, their own territory, because we've lived since time immemorial on this land without confronting, you know, global climate catastrophe or chaos. And so why is that? Like, these are questions we should really be asking ourselves, you know, and, and saying that it's not just about this kind of romantic idea of like, you know, we're somehow like, you know, Avatar or the Navi or whatever. <laughs> it's, this is, these are real people. These are people's real lives. Like this is, this is something that exists. Indigenous economies do exist. I wouldn't say that they're entirely anti-capitalist in many ways, but they're definitely non-capitalist. And the, and the cultural values that we've inherited over generations, they may have destroyed our non-capitalist like mode of living or economies, but nonetheless, the, the culture, the knowledge, the language, the spirituality that we've inherited, the remnants of which that survived boarding school systems that survived the civilization regulations that survived all these periods of genocide and onslaught still retain the values of trying to be in good relation with, you know, what, you know, what the Western world calls the natural environment. We don't see a separation, you know, this isn't a wild phenomenon, but I think when people hear that they're, you know, like, again, the flute music plays, but it's it's being practiced and it's it's being experimented on in, in in different countries. The rights of nature movement, which the White Earth Reservation has invoked, and it's the fence of Monomen because it's in their treaty, uh, began in the global South. You know, at the you know it, we can point to the the 2010 Cochabamba Accords in Bolivia, where they spelled out specifically the rights of nature, um, but it was part of this broader kind of anti-imperialist you know, a climate agenda that was very much ahead of its time. Like, okay, we have the Green New Deal, whatever. But this is talking about not only um, the rights of nature, but it's also talking about climate debt. Why is it that a country like Bolivia that doesn't have, you know, near the, the emissions impact of like countries like the United States and historically, why are they, they, they can't develop the same way that the United States did by producing that amount of carbon? Why are they denied not only the the ability to develop and, and emit carbon but then they're also denied the technology mm -hmm. to you know have sustainable energy whether it's you know through you know solar panels or whatever and so these are like 
questions that we have to like wrestle with. And it's indigenous movements that are, that have really wrestled with those questions. Uh, and I also just want to say that this isn't a particular kind of essentialist ethnic project, but it's def it's fundamentally universal because it's like y'all breathe the same air as we do. You drink the same water. You know, we have a, a knowledge that exists prior to the United States and will exist much longer after the United States, but that doesn't make us any less human than you are, right? And so I think the the kind of the profundity of the water protector is that it was a universal label. It was a universal identity. Anyone who walked through the gates of Standing Rock became a water protector. Anyone who is at the Line 3 camps here, you know, uh, trying to stop the Line 3, the last tar sands pipeline was a water protector. And so I think that, you know, in many ways, really shows the the impact of of indigenous movements in this particular moment yeah we are leaders but we can't be the only solution it, it requires you know a broader way a broader array of forces and for us to be taken seriously you know yeah absolutely absolutely um a few questions that we have gotten in the chat are around education um you know so we've got a question from Canada and a question uh, from uh, Maine around um, going back to boarding schools around how can we work towards um, both uh, the truth and the education and people being more aware of this is issue, but also reconciliation. And, and one thing I always think about and that you really that I think you pointed out into your talk is that we are so early in the process, we don't even have a full account of the damage that was done we don't even know the names and how many and where they're buried you know the children who were killed in these institutions so as a historian you know what do you, what do you think needs to happen for this important era of history to be more well documented and to be shared and for you know the united states to have the reckoning that it needs to have with it I, that's a really good question and um i, I would point listeners and people who are viewing this to the work of Denise Lajamadir, you know, one of the founders of the Native American Boarding School Healing Project, because it's something, this is something that they've articulated and spelled out, you know, and had have, have convinced, have partially convinced me on some of this stuff about, because, you know, like, even with the faults of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that happened in Canada, nonetheless, there's a common discourse among everyday Canadians that residential schools happened, that this affected generations of indigenous people. It happened, right? In this country and in this society, we sound like conspiratorial, like we, we, like we can't even acknowledge it. You know, like there is no common vocabulary that we have, right? We don't even know, there isn't even, there isn't a lot of even like, um, psychological, you know, studies that we can turn to, to help people cope with that kind of thing. Right. And those are important questions. And I'm not an expert in that, in that field. But what I would say though, is that the, you know, the, the truth and reconciliation process, we should look to Canada for the, the way that it has changed the discourse, but has fundamentally not changed the colonial relation. Canada is still building pipelines, not only in first nation lands, but in our lands as well, as we could see with Enbridge, like the, the, continual plunder of indigenous communities has not stopped. So I don't think that we can even begin to the conversation of reconciliation. First of all, reconciliation, you know, the root root is conciliation and reconciliation means that at some point in time we had good relations. I'm not quite sure when that point in time is. If you can tell me, you know, please point it out. Um, but I would prefer the term justice because what does justice look like? Justice looks like a plan of action that is made by the victims of a crime. Not saying that, you know, we just had some misunderstandings, class of cultures, you know, this kind of thing that we, you know, you know, that bad things happened on both sides. Um, but fundamentally, we need to think about what justice looks like according to indigenous values and traditions. Because often what happens if we can if we can point to precedent in this country, we should point to treaty rights, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we should point to treaty rights because treaty rights are often interpreted by only one side, and that's the United States. And we go through the court system and we often cede our interpretation. And so I think we should look at like 
how indigenous ways of knowing and experiences should also be at the foreground of talking about justice first and foremost. Yeah. Um, that doesn't even begin the, quant the the conversation about how do we document the the magnitude of these atrocities. I think that that's a perfect transition to the last question I wanted to ask you, which is that there's this hashtag or slogan, it's on t-shirts and murals um, of land back that's become uh, popularized first by indigenous youth and now has become um, a catchphrase that I think a lot of different folks from activists to organizers are using. Um, for folks who've never heard of it, what is what is the vision and the values that 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 tagline or that phrase evokes for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think like fundamentally the settler colonial project has always been about land. You know, that's what the founding of this country is on. That's where wealth is derived. Um, and so when we talk about land, and I, I always like to push the, push the conversation beyond just what the federal government did and thinking about the, the corporate and private interests that are involved, right? The checker, the white checker at Walmart in Rapid City does not have anything in common with Ted Turner, who owns 200,000 acres of Lakota Treaty Territory in West River, South Dakota, they have nothing in common. So when we say something like land back, oftentimes, you know, it's like the average, you know, white person or non-native person might think that they're just kind of a temporarily embarrassed mass landowner, but they're not, you know, most people are not owners in this society. We're talking about vested interests like Ted Turner, who also owns the world's largest privately owned buffalo herd, you know, <laughs> like he's not, you know, he's, he's, he's like one of many people. Right. And so fundamentally, like if you even read, I think Indian collective has spelled this out as well as other organizations, like we've talked about it in the red deal. If you work the land and you produce value from that land, you should have a say in how that, how, like what happens with that land itself. Black people have worked the land, but they've been categorically denied ownership of the land. That's one of the ways that they're, they've been racialized as a population, as a group of people. 95% of, of, of agricultural landowners in the United States are white. Like, why is that? You know, this is obviously like, you know, if we think about uh, apartheid South Africa, um, Afrikaners owned, white Afrikaners owned about 70% of the land, right? And they made up like 3% of the population. In the United States, it's 95% of the agricultural land, right? And so, and a lot of these uh, people, a lot of these interests are large, you know, corporate industrial agricultural mm -hmm. conglomerates. It's We're not talking about taking somebody's apartment or taking somebody's own home, but we have to fundamentally have a, a different relationship to the land itself. And that doesn't just mean, this isn't just an indigenous problem. This is everybody's mm -hmm. problem because we all live on the land. And so for land back, that's what it really means. It's like who works the land, who who ta takes care of the land. Yeah, white people can take care of the land, like going back to the the identity of a water protector, right? But it's fundamentally challenging the relations because property, private property is fundamentally about relations that have supplanted indigenous relations, right? And into a kind of exclusive for-profit enterprise and one that benefits a small sector of society land back in the way that I understand it looks not only to federal lands and says, why is it that this is held in, you know, the common interest, um, but is often, you know, as we can see with like the Bureau of Land Management, often in the benefit of private interests, right? Or why is it that, you know, the majority of agricultural land of where we get our food, how we eat is controlled and owned by a handful of people. And I think land back is about land back to indigenous nations, not not just people or individuals, but nations, because this goes back to the question of justice, but it's also fundamentally challenging us to consider why is it that people who are denied citizenship or incorporation into the society, the ones who work the land, the ones who produce the food that we eat, also categorically denied from being in relation and correct relation with that land itself. So it's, it's not a kind of self-serving indigenous project, but I, we have conceived of it as a kind of a broader kind of social justice framework. Uh, absolutely. I think that that's a great 
point to end on um, for tonight. Um, we're out of time, but I just want to say um, thank you, Nick. I always just I so appreciate having time to be in conversation with you. I really appreciate your writing and your thoughts on these really important issues. Um, thank you to the Landon Foundation and Haymarket Books um, for sponsoring this. And um, lastly, for people who are interested in your work, who want to follow more of your writing, um, where can they find you? So I'm on Twitter at Nick, N-I-C-K-W-E-S-T-E-S. -E and... Yeah, just <laughs> go there, I guess. And also check out the Red Nation podcast and your podcast, by the way, which is really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, definitely some resources um, to learn more. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us tonight. And I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you.